Welcome everybody to the webinar, The Fracking Ban in the Delaware River Watershed. My name is Tracy Carluccio. I'm Deputy Director of Delaware Riverkeeper Network. And also presenting in the webinar tonight is Karen Faridan, and she's of Burke's Gas Truth. And we'll be going through the basic issues that are involved with the proposed hydraulic fracturing ban that the DRBC has put forward for the Delaware River watershed and also the draft natural gas regulations. Due to stormy weather, the internet is very sketchy tonight. So you may get bumped off. If you do, just log back in the way that you originally came back in. We may also get bumped off. And if we do, please be patient and we'll come back on. This webinar is the first in our January series. And our goal is to support a complete and permanent ban throughout the Delaware River watershed on natural gas drilling and all of its activities. Burke's Gas Truth and Delaware Riverkeeper Network will be answering questions through the chat box at the bottom of your screen after, these, after we complete the slideshow. So please, if you have questions or um, want us to address something, uh, write, write into the chat box, and that's an interactive chat box, and uh, Karen or I will answer it um, verbally through the webinar screen. First tonight, we're examining why we need to ban fracking in the watershed. And the other two webinars this month, we'll look at other two important issues. We'll explain that to you in a minute. But the purpose is for us to share information with you that you can use to help prepare for the hearings that are coming up in January a little later this month, and also for filing your written comment, which is due on February 28th. And we have some links that we'll be providing, in case you don't already have them, um, about the details of the natural gas public comment uh, regulation public comment period. So whether or not we're going to ban fracking uh, in the Delaware River watershed is going to be decided really in the coming months. It's been a long row, uh, road to, to travel. Uh, beginning in 2010 and to this day, um, we, there has been a moratorium, um, but now we're facing the opportunity to have a complete ban on fracking adopted. And um, this decision, it cannot be overstressed, but this decision will decide the future of our watershed and those who live here and, and enjoy the watershed and drink its water. So just to quickly review where we're at, uh, what is the DRBC doing? The Delaware River Basin Commission has a de facto fracking moratorium in place. And that has been in place since 2010. It came under attack by industry recently, um, the end of last year and the beginning of this year. And uh, we, as a community, came together and have been attending all of the Delaware River Basin Commission meetings and advocating strongly that a complete ban be put in place to replace the moratorium, which could be removed at any time. It's called de facto because it basically prohibited the issuing of permits for any sort of drilling or fracking within the watershed and any activities associated with that, such as water withdrawals or wastewater discharges. Um, but it could be undone by the vote of the governors of the four states. And it can also be put, made permanent by the governors of the four states. So as I'm sure all of you know, the four states whose streams flow to the Delaware are Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. And those governors will be deciding whether to ban it completely, to partially ban it, and or to put regulations that would allow some of fracking's relating act related activities. Over the next three webinars, we'll be examining those three things. So what's the next step? Well, the DRBC has posted draft regulations on, on November 30th for public comment. They propose a ban on high volume hydraulic fracturing throughout the entire Delaware River Basin. But they also issued draft regulations that allow storage, processing, and discharge of frac wastewater from outside of the basin and the export of water from the watershed for fracking elsewhere. Of course, our coalition adamantly opposes this. It makes no sense to ban fracking and allow frac wastewater and water for fracking to go on. Today, we will focus on why we need to support the proposal to ban fracking. 
and we cannot assume because that has been proposed that it's a fait accompli. As a matter of fact, it could be knocked down um, easily by not adapt adopting that section of the proposed regulations. January 11th, we're going to be looking at the water withdrawal draft rule. We'll be going over what that rule actually says and what are the impacts that we can expect of water withdrawal for fracking outside of our watershed. January 18th, we're going to be looking at frack wastewater rule. And that rule would allow the, as I, I mentioned earlier, the discharge and the storage and the processing of frack wastewater here from outside of the watershed. The DRBC has public hearings scheduled January 23rd and January 25th. Those details are at the Facebook link that we've provided here and um, you've also on Burke's Gas Truth and Delaware Riverkeeper Network and our other uh, colleague organizations who are active in this campaign's websites. The public comment period closes February 28th at 5 p.m. That's for written public comment. So what do we know? Well, we know that drilling and fracking can't be done safely. We know that the weight of evidence that has built up particularly over the last seven years since the DRBC banned fracking almost eight years now, that fracking and its related activities pollute and they gravely harm human health and the environment. And that's an indelible and long-standing harm. We know the public opposes fracking and we also know to achieve a complete and permanent ban, we need to make this case on the DRBC record. So just to, again, quickly look at what is the context of this hydraulic fracturing proposed ban? Well, the Delaware River watershed is 13,000 square miles just under that. It encompasses the four states that I mentioned, and it, the river is 330 miles long. It's, uh, the east and west branches come in New York come together. They join at Hancock, and then they flow down along the boundary of New York and Pennsylvania along New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and then Delaware as it enters the Delaware estuary and the bay and flowing into the Atlantic Ocean. The Delaware is a national wild and scenic river. It was the second river in the United States um, uh, that was designated by Congress as a wild and scenic river. And it is also a national estuary and recognized for its importance as a, as a uh, bay. It is also the largest free-flowing river east of the Mississippi, and that has a lot to do with why it's so healthy. 17 million people drink water from the Delaware River, and that includes New York City and Philadelphia. And even though our main stem is not dammed, there are dams on the tributaries, particularly the large reservoirs and the upper Delaware tributaries. Those are the reservoirs that feed water to New York City. So on any given day, between 7 and 9 million people in New York are drinking the high-quality De Delaware River water. Delaware River Basin Commission adopted a special protection waters a designation for the entire non-tidal river. It took several years to do this. Delaware Riverkeeper Network put forward a petition that resulted back in 1990, and over the years, different sections of the river have been added to the Wild and Scenic Rivers Program, and then through uh, an, a special adoption of regulations by the Delaware River Basin Commission into a special protection waters designation. And that designation prohibits the degradation of the water quality of the Delaware River. That's why we believe it is absolutely legally impossible to ever allow fracking here. So also just to try to quickly uh, point out where uh, exactly what the hydraulic fracturing prohibition says in the proposed regulations and where uh, we would expect if they were to drill, it would happen. So the proposed ban would ban what they call high volume hydraulic fracturing in quote, all hydro hydrocarbon bearing formations. This is the same um, uh, uh, designation of high volume hydraulic fracturing that they have in New York. Uh, it includes all the deep formations which would be the Marcellus and the Utica shales. And high volume is uh, uh, defined as using more than 300,000 gallons of water during all stages of well drilling. So that pretty much covers uh, what we would expect uh, to be used in order to do any sort of drilling in the watershed. Right now, remember, 
the moratorium that's in place covers all drilling, not just fracking. So we would really prefer it to cover all drilling, not only high volume hydraulic fracturing. Um, there are other shales in the Delaware River watershed, not shown on this map that was uh, put together by the Delaware River Basin Commission. It's the South Newark Basin. It covers parts of Bucks and Montgomery County. It also covers uh, north and western portions of New Jersey. And those shales are not as deep, but they are also deep. They would probably take more than 300,000 gallons uh, to develop during all stages of well drilling. But it is important to know um, that there are other shales in the watershed that could be exploited. Uh, so this hydraulic fracturing ban would cover uh, high volume hydraulic fracturing throughout all those shale formations. Uh, and that's what's proposed. It's a very short section in the proposed regulations. I think everybody knows what hydraulic fracturing or fracking is. Um, you take the water, you mix it with chemicals and propants, um, primarily sand, which is mined in states, many of them in, in the Midwest and West. And then it's injected down a well bore, which goes about a mile down, and then turn, and typically turns horizontally for um, uh, several miles. It can go a mile or two or now several miles. And then um, under very high pressure, the water and the chemicals um, are used to frack in stages the horizontal well bore in order to release the gas from the fissures in the deep rock formations there. And the flow back that comes back up and the produced water that comes back up, which are usually called wastewaters uh, uh, when you refer to them in a, in a combined form, uh, are then captured and they have to be disposed of uh, according to uh, clean water laws. Uh, but we'll talk about what the flaws in those laws are. Um, typically, it goes to, a, to wastewater treatment or, or an injection well. About 90% of all wastewater that is produced by fracking today goes to injection wells because it's so difficult to treat. And they don't treat it then. They just um, uh, inject it down into an injection well, which we consider just moving the problem from one place to, to another place and from one time to another time. It doesn't treat the water. It simply stores it there. And there are problems associated with that. So um, there's a lot of uh, impacts that are felt by communities and, and are experienced by the environment where fracking is going on. We certainly don't have enough time on this webinar to go through all of them. That's why we have provided the talking points document that you all should have gotten by email. Um, we also are providing um, a link to that in the email that was sent to you. And when we send the recording out of this webinar, we'll send another copy of it. It's a working document that has a lot of references and links in it that can get you to treasure troves of information about all the um, impacts um, that communities and the environment are experiencing where fracking is occurring. But just to quickly go over some of the important points, um, it's the conversion of land. And it can be a forest or natural land. Um, it can be farms. It can be um, residential areas to an industrial ra a landscape, basically. And that's for the well pad and the roads and the tanks. And also for um, if, if open pits are used, which they are in some states, um, and reservoirs that hold the water, it all, you all, all that gets uh, put into the area around a well. Um, the, also, of course, it's the destructions of farms and food production, wildlife habitat, water supply reservoirs, and natural resources. And we also have increased runoff, of course, and erosion and stormwater pollution from the well sites. We're going to talk about that a little bit more because of some exemptions and federal laws which make it worse than it even should be. Locally, of course, there's a lot of impacts. The influx of truck traffic, over 1,400 trips per well. Um, and multiple well pad sites require then um, for each of those wells another 1,400 uh, truck trips. And then you have, of course, the huge consumption of water, which is totally depleted because the water is never returned to the condition it was in before or the source it was in before. It used to be three to five million gallons. Now it's closer to 10 million gallons or greater um, that each well uses. Sorry, I'm having a coughing fit here a little bit. 
We also have air pollution from the diesel fuel equipment and also the infrastructure off-gassing from the tanks, and that uh, we'll discuss a little bit under the exemptions as well. We have, of course, uh, fires, emergency spills, and leaks. We also have the pressurized injection of highly toxic chemicals into the ground to develop the wells. Between 750 and 900 different chemicals are used. Many of them are carcinogens. Some are hazardous air or water pollutants, but because of exemptions, again, we don't even know what they all are. Also, the discharge of inadequately treated polluted and possibly toxic wastewater to groundwater and our streams and water supplies is a regular occurrence. Part of it is because of inadequate regulation. Part of it is because they just can't avoid it. Of course, there's scenic impacts and the quality of life changes for the entire targeted region and the indelible footprint of all the infrastructure, the pipelines, the processing facilities, the storage depots, the compressors, also gathering lots and their compressors that, that take that gas to market. And of course, we have public health impacts, impacts that are mounting because that data is finally being collected where uh, fracking is occurring. And those effects are from air and water and land pollution, and they're devastating the communities where fracking is occurring. We also, and we're not going to uh, stress that a lot tonight, but of course there's methane releases, and that's contributing powerful greenhouse gas methane to the atmosphere. Now, fracking is exempt from sections of every major federal environmental law, and the result is devastating. A lot of the problems that we talk about is because of those exemptions, but also, and we're going to talk about this in a slide coming up, it's also in, 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 in the fracking process itself. We have water and air pollution and ground and surface water contamination made worse because of the federal exemption from the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Also from the Comprehensive Environmental Response um, uh, uh, Compensation and Liability Act, the Superfund Law, and the Community Right to Know Act, which includes the Toxics Resource Inventory. Portions of the Clean Air Act are also exempted. And hazardous materials that are produced by oil and gas development are not classified as hazardous under RICRA uh, due to an EPA determination. So they can be uh, improperly disposed of, and that means sometimes even put on roadways, um, certain waste are sent to landfills, and the, the wastewater itself does not go and undergo the rigorous uh, disposal requirements that it should, should um, the subtitle C of RICRA apply to oil and gas, which it doesn't. Um, toxics um, are also released to the environment without tracking, which they would have under the toxics resource inventory. And the Superfund law, of course, um, applies to, everything, to other sorts of industrial operations, but not to oil and gas. And the reason, uh, the reason for that is because it's been decided by EPA that um, it, it does not warrant it, but we do know and there are, are efforts right now to change that because we do know that there are toxics released to the environment that are simply not tracked. Groundwater and aquifer pollution is made more, difficult, more uh, problematic because of the exemption under the Safe Drinking Water Act or what's called the Halliburton loophole. So the Safe Drinking Water Act would require very special handling and not allow certain toxics that are regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act to be injected into the ground. But that does not apply to fracking. Also, the drillers and operators are allowed to keep secret the chemicals they use in fracking. Now, Pennsylvania does require some disclosure, but this uh, Delaware River watershed applies to all four states. But also, there are still secret chemicals being used in Pennsylvania, and we'll be hearing about that more in, in our um, January 18th webinar. <coughs> Surface impacts are not regulated properly, and that's because of the exemption from the Clean Water Act stormwater provisions. Really, there is no uh, um, rigorous requirement for the restoration of a site or even the careful handling of the site except for the minimal erosion and, and stormwater provisions that a state might apply, uh, 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 require. Um, a well to comply with. 
As a matter of fact, where fracking is occurring, the National Academy of Sciences have done um, a, a study and found that streams adjacent to gas wells are negatively impacted by runoff and sedimentation. And that harms the benthic life and the fish and wildlife and is causing streams to be eroded and destabilized. It's not overstating it to say that streams adjacent to heavily fracked areas are basically being turned into ditches. So let's take uh, a look, a little closer look at the risks of fracking to groundwater. There's a lot of science that, on this, and it was actually developed um, early on when fracking um, came to the fore uh, in the middle 2000s up to 2010 in Pennsylvania, but a lot has been done since then uh, in terms of studying these risks and what the effects are, the actual effects on the ground of fracking to groundwater. The chemicals in fracking flu fluids will migrate to drinking water aqu aquifers and to the surface. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And the reason that scientists are saying this is because when you consider the corrosive downhole environment, that is the downhole of the bore, the environment there is very corrosive. And when you consider the lack of durability of the cement sealant and the steel well, well casings that are supposed to keep that segregated from the environment, um, the aquifers and the surface waters, um, then uh, you can see aquifers and surface, surface waters are not sufficiently isolated from the toxic fluids. Can you still hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. So I, it was like a funny sound, and I thought my phone went off. So um, the aquifers could be impacted quickly, such as when there was a faulty cement seal or a casing during construction, or it can happen over time. Tony and Graffia did a, uh, from Cornell uh, did a seminal paper on this, and he, uh, he found that about 6 to 7 percent of all wells were failing within a year in Pennsylvania because basically of these uh, faulty cement seals or casing leaks um, during construction, within the first year, that is. Um, but over time, about 60 percent are expected to fail in the first 10 to 30 years. And th this is a problem because an aquifer is basically, uh, uh, the life of an aquifer is basically as long as humans access it and as long as the earth is here. But if our uh, seals and our casings are failing and they are expected to fail according to um, uh, scientists completely between 80 and, 10, and 100 years from now, then it's inevitable that we will be ruining our groundwater sources for future generations. So we could have a very quick problem, or we could have a problem that surfaces in 20 years or 30 years, but it will definitely happen because of the cement and steel that only has a life of 80 to 100 years in about 100 years. So we are really making a problem now that cannot be undone by future generations. Once you pollute an aquifer, it's very difficult to clean it up. Contaminated fluids from the fracking process can move from the deep shale to water resources through pathways other than broken seals. And that includes natural vertical flow and fractures in the rock. And that's explained by scientists such as Tom Myers, and we have links to his report as well as Tony and Graffius um, and Paul Rubin's reports in the talking points. And that it just gives you a lot more um, detailed information if you want to look into this issue. Karen Ferradin from Burke's Gas Truth is now going to pick up the next few slides. Karen? Thanks, Tracy. Can everybody hear me? I'm going to take that as a yes. Good. I see some comments. So great. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the um, evidence that we have that comes not just from the Marcellus Shale, but on this first slide that we're going to look at, um, there's a uh, huge amount of scientific information and statistical analysis that comes out of the concerned health professionals of New York and Physicians for Social Responsibility, where and if you've never looked at that site, and, and the link there is at the bottom, Concerned Healthy or New York, uh, Concerned Healthy New York, um, or I can't speak to that, slash compendium, or simply search 
fracking compendium on Google, I can say that without spitting it out. Um, if you search that and look at the compendium, if you've never seen it, it's this massive amount of information that chronicles all of the different studies and all of the investigative journalism reports and documents on fracking. And it's organized in reverse chronological order um, by subject so that you can get a whole lot of information on everything that's out there on fracking, not just in the Marcellus, but everywhere. Um, and so those 685 studies that are cited here on this slide are referenced there, uh, and they're summarized there very nicely. But that number comes from a different organization. It comes from physicians uh, and scientists and engineers for healthy energy, and they used to do this analysis that they stopped doing. So that number's actually a little bit old. That number um, has been... Uh, not doubled by any means, but I think there's certainly hundreds more studies since that last analysis was done. And if you were to go to their website, you would be able to find um, the analysis that showed, and this is why it was so important and why it's still such a good number to use, uh, it would show that in their analysis they could find that the vast majority of the studies in the three different areas that they looked at, which was water impacts, air impacts, and health impacts, that the vast majority of the studies pointed to existing problems that were already on the ground or things that were likely to occur based on everything that was already happening. And so... It's a great resource in and of itself. The compendium goes into way more detail about each of the studies. But if you were to go to um, PSE Healthy Energy's website as well and see that analysis, the analysis that they used to do, you'll also find a database that contains all of the studies. So you can look through and find at least abstracts for all of the studies that we're talking about in addition to this fantastic compendium. And so when you look across the, the you know, the the world's uh, you know, research on fracking, one of the things that stands out to me, having met people from other parts of the world, having read a lot of these studies, is that you find a lot of the same problems no matter where you look. And so these are not problems that are specific to one area. It's, it, you know, it's almost compelling to see just the fact that these problems occur everywhere you frack. And so, um, so it's a really great body of knowledge to have at your fingertips. You can get a lot of good data out of it for any comments that you want to write. Um, remember, like Tracy said earlier, it's so important to, to focus on things that DRBC cares about. So, you know, they're, they don't necessarily consider climate change to be in their purview for this decision, but, you know, so focus on water. That's what they care about. Focus on things that would, you know, have an impact to the water, a river basin, the land use issues and things like that. You know, those are the things to worry about. Um, those are the kinds of studies to look for, and you'll find more than enough information in the compendium. You can follow that link at the bottom that I <laughs> tried to say earlier and couldn't say so well. But on the next slide, though, you can actually drill down, no pun intended, to the Marcellus and what's actually going on here. And here are some stats on what's happening in the Marcellus, for instance, in, um, on the PA and Department of Environmental Protection's website. Um, they have this really poorly constructed list because it's a PDF that you can barely search in any way, but they list all of the positive determinations that they have issued on water contamination of private water supplies in Pennsylvania. And so it's now up to 301 is the most recent number. And when it says here on the slide, private water well cases, it doesn't mean um, private water wells. It means the number of cases because very often the letters could uh, refer to a number of different wells that are all kind of lumped together in one case or a number of families relying on one well. So you can't really assume that we're talking about some number of properties or families or wells. You know, we're talking about cases, and that can be a much, much bigger number. Nevertheless, that number, 301 cases, and I'm trying to imagine how many people that pertains to, does not even come close to the number of complaints that have been filed with the DEP in the last 12 years from 2004 through November of 2016. The uh, investigative group called um, Public Herald did a really in-depth uh, dig into all of the files, the file reviews, and write-to-know requests, and got all of this information from the DEP about the number of complaints that have actually been filed and found that more than 4,400 complaints have been filed with the DEP. Again, that 301 doesn't even hold a candle to what the actual concerns expressed have been in this state. So relying on that number is important because it does talk about confirmed cases, but you can see that so many Pennsylvanians have filed complaints about water that have not necessarily been responded to. And the even bigger number is the full number of complaints beyond just water complaints. And that's 
9,443 that they found in that span of time. So, you know, there are an awful lot of things happening on the ground that people have been trying to report, not necessarily getting the response that they deserve, but it certainly proves that there is a huge impact happening in the Marcellus. And, of course, there's the big EPA study that was an incredibly controversial study because of a claim that they made when they first issued their draft report that said there were no widespread systemic impacts to groundwater or to drinking water. And, um, and actually, that caused such an uproar because that claim was not supported in the actual report that they put out. So a lot of people, including some people on this call, put a lot of pressure on the EPA Science Advisory Board to walk that thing back and the other thing that was missing from that huge study were three very important cases, including one that's right here in, in the watershed, and that's Dimmick, Pennsylvania. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's sort of the ground zero case for Pennsylvania on fracking that many, many people have paid attention to. It was a big subject of an EPA investigation at the time, and yet that one, Parker County, Texas, and Pavilion, Wyoming, didn't even make it into their report. And so the Science Advisory Board said you need to you know, take out that claim, it's not supported, and you need to include evidence or information about all of these studies that were happening that never got mentioned. And that really changed the report in the end. It was finalized at the end of 2016. And so it's you know, really well worth it to point out that the EPA now has confirmed that, in fact, water has been contaminated, especially in places like Dimmick, Pennsylvania, where so many people have been affected by it. And it's really important for that story to be brought home because obviously, you know, we're talking about an area that is, you know, a big part of the Delaware River Basin. And so it's important to look at what other governments are doing. And it's significant to note that, of course, New York has banned fracking. Uh, but last year, um, Maryland also banned fracking. Now, when New York did it, they did it um, after doing a massive health study that took years. And it was the seminal work of its time because you know, nobody was doing that kind of work. Like in Pennsylvania, they've never done a health study. So it was really, really a massive, exhaustive process and came up with a brilliant report uh, that did influence the governor to put the ban on fracking. Maryland did their own version of it. It wasn't as intensive a report, but you know, a lot more research was already available by the time they were doing theirs. But the other thing that's significant about what happened in Maryland it was that it was done by the legislature, the decision to ban fracking, and it had bipartisan support, and the bill was signed by a Republican governor. And why is that significant? Because these are two states that sit atop Pennsylvania or below Pennsylvania. Our immediate neighbors are seeing what's happening in places like here where fracking is going on. They're looking at what's going on actually very near the basin and they're saying, no, we don't want that here in our own states. The basin has been spared all of that. We need to keep it that way. And so I'm going to turn it back to Tracy to um, sum up the last slide here, but then we'll be happy to take your questions. Tracy? Great. Thank you, Karen. So this is the first in a series of webinars, and we wanted to take a look at the proposal to actually ban fracking in the watershed first. And on January 11th at 6.30, the same time as this one tonight, we're going to look at water extraction and the export of water from the Delaware River watershed um, to other places for fracking. Of course, um, we're totally opposed to this. Um, not only is it damaging environmentally, but also we don't want to be the watershed that fuels fracking elsewhere. Um, it's simply immoral. Um, so we're going to be looking at that issue from a technical viewpoint, and we're going to be, going to be examining the section of the draft rules that talk about how they propose to regulate water extraction and export. And then on Thursday, January 18th at 6.30 p.m., we're going to be looking at the waste uh, water uh, discharge and processing draft regulations that have been issued by the Delaware River Basin Commission. And of course, the concept of importing toxic wastewater from fracking uh, to the Delaware River watershed or to allow it to be discharged to surface water anywhere um, is totally unacceptable. And we will be fighting both of these provisions tooth and nail, and I'm sure all of you will be fighting right along with us. There's a huge body of science today that explains why fracking wastewater really should never be discharged to surface water at all, even if put through the industrial treatment processes that are considered to be state of the art. 
So um, as we move forward um, with going through some of the Q&A, uh, some of the questions that have been put in the chat box. I do want to point out again that we have the talking points document. I see a couple of people said they didn't see it. If you registered after um, uh, earlier, I think I sent it out maybe at 1 o'clock today, if you registered after that, um, then you didn't get it. We'll be attaching it again when we send out the, uh, the recording of this webinar, so you'll be able to get that um, document. We also have a, a link uh, to the document on Delaware Riverkeeper Network's website, and perhaps um, Peter um, or somebody can type that link in um, to the chat box. Otherwise, if, uh, if that's not able to get into the chat box, we'll be able to uh, send it to you. Uh, it's included in the email that has the uh, Talking Points document attached to it. Um, we will be doing up a new Talking Points document for the water webinar and another one for the wastewater uh, webinar. Um, so looking at some of the, uh, the questions and comments here, um, somebody asked about Burks. Uh, the, uh, to, can we spell it out? It is on this last slide here. Uh, the link to Burks Gas Truth is spelled out there, um, how you say the name of the organization, and then the actual website where you go to Burks Gas Truth. And that logo, Don't Frack Your Mother, is Burke's Gas <laughs> Truth logo. Um, so uh, I think you have all the information you need there. Um, so here's uh, another question. Um, will any of the participant organizations protecting the Delaware River water quality argue to compromise uh, with DRBC? Should they agree to a permanent ban on fracking? Um, I think that as far as our coalition, well, as far as the coalition uh, to ban fracking in the Delaware River watershed, um, which is made up really of about um, 20, 20 some groups that are working um, you know, regularly on this. And the most recent letter, uh, the original letter that we filed for a ban, the beginning of the year with the Delaware River Basin Commission was signed by 140 organizations. And uh, the one that we just filed asking for changes um, really demanding changes to the totally inadequate public input process they've put together. Um, that was signed um, by 109 organizations. So there are a lot of organizations that are committed to achieving a complete and permanent ban on fracking throughout the watershed and all its activities. And I think there could possibly be um, some outliers who would say, oh, well, we should just you know, adopt safe regulations, and maybe if we make the regulations strict enough, they won't do it. Uh, we don't go for that. And I think there's absolutely no organization involved in our ban campaign that goes for that. Um, I think, uh, as a matter of fact, um, you know, we, we have our attorneys looking at this, and for Delaware Riverkeeper Network, uh, from our perspective, we'll be suing them and we believe we'll win if they try to not ban it and if they try to adopt um, the draft regulations that they've proposed. We believe that it's illegal and it's absolutely incompatible uh, with the water supply mandate that the Delaware River Basin has um, to deliver clean water um, and, and drinkable water and to protect the water resources of the Delaware River watershed. So, um, so I think, you know, will there be um, any challenges to the permanent ban? Yes. I'm sure, um, you know, there is a huge, um, you know, group of pro drillers, not, not so much in the Delaware River watershed as they used to be when the moratorium was first put in place um, because there were leases signed at that time. And a lot of the area in the upper Delaware, um, particularly in Pennsylvania, but also in New York State in the upper reaches um, where the Marcellus Shale is, were leased out. So there was um, a strong contingent of uh, leaseholders who um, you know did not who were opposed to the moratorium and they've tried in different ways to overturn it and have been unsuccessful. Um, we believe that probably there will be in industry interest that will try to overturn any ban that's enacted. We believe that um, the DRBC has the absolute authority to ban fracking in the watershed and that that will prevail in the courts. There is a legal challenge that has been brought right now. Uh, it, was, it was brought early, um, actually the end of last year, and it's one of the reasons that we became so concerned and started work redoubling our efforts to achieve a complete ban in the watershed. Uh, we had started that campaign really um, over a, in 2016, very early in 2016, but we really redoubled our efforts because the Wayne 
Lamb Mineral Group filed a lawsuit against the DRBC saying that DRBC did not have the jurisdiction to ban fracking in the Delaware River watershed. It's basically they're an industry um, backed group that uh, trumped up some land, put it together on the border of Wayne County and Susquehanna County, straddling the Delaware River and Susquehanna River watersheds, um, and um, brought this challenge to try to uh, frack on their land, um, basically for private property rights. Um, and they have not been successful in court. Um, as a matter of fact, they lost in lower court, Delaware Riverkeeper Network, um, and uh, intervened in, in that um, lawsuit, and we were able to argue in court twice so far on that. Um, they lost in lower court, it was appealed. Um, there have been oral arguments and a decision is pending from uh, the, the higher court um, on this issue. Um, we believe that um, legally um, all the rights are there on the side of the, of the Delaware River Basin to have the authority to ban fracking. Um, I hope that answered that question for you. Um, how are the sites for injection wells chosen? Um, what, so as far as injection wells are concerned, um, you know, it is interesting because they, we, we put into the talking points that they did not mention injection wells in the draft regulations, and the Delaware River Basin Commission does not prohibit them now. They're, they just have never been approached um, to put one in as far as we know. So I think that um, you know we, we feel that in our comment we're going to need to put together an argument about, about why injection wells should not be allowed. Um, they, they look for geology that's supposed to keep um, the fluids that are injected um, separated from the environment, um, like salt caverns and uh, is a typical uh, one that they use. But as we know, these are not foolproof. Some of the, the um, largest uh, caverns that have been used uh, are for injection wells um, uh, ha have already um, been compromised, but uh, in Ohio, they've drilled injection wells d down into um, the geology, um, mainly around Youngstown, and they started causing earthquakes. In Oklahoma, earthquakes have also occurred where there have never been any earthquake earthquakes before, and USGS has documentation on their website that shows that the over-injection of fluids into these well bores that they've actually drilled to hold the, these waste fluids um, uh, it has leaked, has caused um, fractures, basically. And what's happening is then that causes small earthquakes. And how big they can actually become, we don't know yet. Um, but they did put a, a moratorium on certain wells in Ohio because of, of the, uh, the earthquakes that were being uh, caused. So what is the right geology? I don't think the industry knows. I don't think the government knows. Uh, they're now allowing the drilling of these injection wells um, in Pennsylvania. There's one that's um, uh, being uh, developed in Pennsylvania and uh, is being opposed adamantly by the local community. Um, so we believe that each one of these is an is a experiment, an accident waiting to happen, and really you're just storing away waste, um, and it's going to surface again through some means um, as a problem for future generations, if not sooner. Um, we have a question here about when you say storage of fracking wastewater, is it always injection wells or sometimes in storage tanks? That's a good question um, because they don't say, they just talk about storage and then they, um, you know, it could possibly be in tanks. It could mean temporary storage. Um, there's all sorts of storage that goes on that, that shouldn't go on um, in what they call, you know, temporary um, facilities. Uh, Karen, do you have anything to add on that? No. <laughs> Okay, and uh, here's another question. Is that the 10 million gallons over the life of the well? No. The 10 million gallons um, that uh, we talked about earlier, um, the 5 to 10 million, and actually there's uh, now wells that are taking a lot more water than that in both Ohio and Pennsylvania because of extremely long, several miles long horizontal well bores. And that's per each well, and it's per fracking of the well. Now, fracking is done in stages. And the amount of water that I'm talking about, five to ten to maybe, you know, many times that um, per well is for each well. Um, 
uh, and that includes many fracking stages. Um, and then, of course, multiple wells are typically put on a well pad. So the impact to a local aquifer, um, the impact to a local geology, all of the um, the impacts that happen on that well pad when you have sometimes up to 16 wells on one well pad is um, very intense. And it, what that means is that um, the water that's brought to that well, um, if it's taken from one source, depletes that source tremendously. And then as it's injected into the ground and depleted by being left into the ground, um, and some of it coming back up as wastewater, but a lot of it left into the ground and slowly migrating to the surface over maybe tens or hundreds of years, that water um, also in, very intensely uh, affects that uh, local geology. So the, store, the, the 10 million gallons is per well. And then in terms of refracking wells, a lot of wells that are hydrofracked um, do not have longevity. And the, the uh, greatest productivity is in the first year. And Tony and Graffi has also followed this and done a paper on it. And as you look at the life of the well, it, um, the original productivity that was achieved in the first year is never achieved after that first year. It slowly trends downward. And many times they'll come back and refrack a well a few years later. So that would require the same amount of water again um, and would produce, you know, this, again, the wastewater and all of the impacts that go along with the hydrofracking uh, process. Um, I'm looking here at any other questions. Uh, Karen, did you want to add anything to that? Um, not to that one. There was a comment um, questioning my misstatement about Ms. Dimmick. I was trying to say that Dimmick is near the river basin, not in the river basin. It is in the Susquehanna River Basin. But that raises an interesting thing as we were looking into some of these impacts. One of the studies that, um, that points to some health impacts was one that looked at hospitalization rates for things like cardiac conditions and neurological conditions, and they found a spike uh, in proximity of fracking. And the way that they looked at the data was to look at three northern tier counties in Pennsylvania, and one of them was Wayne that is in the Delaware River Basin, and the other two were Bradford and Susquehanna. And so Demick is right there in Susquehanna. It's very nearby the, the river basin, and yet you know, you move from one county to the next and suddenly you see an increased incidence of these hospitalization or at least a, a spike in hospitalization, hospitalization rates for these various conditions, um, again, in proximity of drilling. When prior to fracking, they were also trending below national averages and they were demographically almost identical. And so there's, you know, that, that's the kind of research that is occurring more and more now where you can see you know, either because they're using massive data sets or things like that where they're looking at like a control county that happens to be one in the river basin that has been spared some of this work that, you know, once you get into fracked areas, you can certainly make correlation, if not established causation, but boy, you certainly see a big correlation these days between things that are occurring to people's health if they happen to be in proximity of fracking, thanks to some of these great studies. So that was a long-winded way of you know, <laughs> correcting myself for my misstatement when I was speaking about Demick. Thank you, Karen. Um, somebody pointed out about uh, the storage of frac wastewater um, on, on well sites being a huge problem, and yes, it is. Uh, we did put a couple of talking points into the um, document on that. We're not focusing on that a lot tonight. That's why we need a whole separate a webinar just on frack waste because it is a huge problem. It's the elephant in the middle of the room for the fracking industry um, because they really don't know what to do with this waste. It's sort of like radioactive waste from a nuclear plant in that they have this waste. They don't know what to do with it. They cannot remove all of the pollutants that are in it. They're not required to remove, and they don't even have systems designed to remove all of the pollutants that are in this frack waste. So that's why 90% of it is going to injection wells where they can just inject it down into a well bore or store it in a cavern and try to keep it out of mind, you know, out of sight, out of mind. That is not an answer to this problem. But we will be focusing on that um, in the uh, frac waste webinar and only just mentioned it here. But 
on the on-site storage is a good point because that is really pretty much what they do with the waste at this point. Um, in other places, like in Pennsylvania, they, they collect the waste and then they uh, re, what they call recycle. It's really just a reuse or repurposing of some of the liquids. Um, there's no treatment requirements that govern how they tr treat that. Um, they simply do it to the standards that the, the driller wants in order to use it again in their next well. And eventually they end up with material that's so contaminated they can't even use it for refracking the next well. And that's when it's sent off, unfortunately, to an injection well. And some of the solids um, are really inappropriately uh, sent off to landfills, um, even though they contain radioactive waste, um, he heavy uh, metals, um, hydrocarbon toxics like BTEX. And, and again, we'll get into that with the wastewater, but the storage on site is a good point because it's another reason that you don't want to have drilling, um, why uh, frack wells are so dangerous, uh, because they do keep this stuff on site in order to reuse it. And many times they even put it into pipelines connecting one well pad to another, and there's very little regulation over those uh, pipelines that move that stuff around too. So there's a lot of spills. There's a lot of um, off-gassing, uh, methanol and formaldehyde, two of the uh, con uh, toxics that are used in fracking, off-gas into the atmosphere. So if the tank, uh, these tanks have, do have vents, um, they're not totally open anymore in Pennsylvania, but it uh, doesn't mean they wouldn't be in any other state uh, that didn't have a regulation requiring tanks. Um, but even the water reservoirs uh, that they have in Pennsylvania and that they could have in the Delaware River watershed where they're supposed to be uh, uh, holding fresh water can have contaminated fluids added to them because they've changed the name of uh, fresh water in, uh, to, to say that they include, can include things such as acid mine drainage and uh, uh, re water reused from industrial processes. So they can mix that into fresh water and hold it into open reservoirs and use that for fracking. So this is how you know, loose the regulations are. And since we cannot get away from the fact that they use toxic chemicals in the frack fluids, we're going to have this problem in fracking. There's no way to avoid it, even if you regulate it as strictly as you possibly could. So I'm glad someone brought up that issue of storing it on site. It's another reason you don't want it in proximity to where people live. It really shouldn't be happening in Pennsylvania or in any state. And we certainly don't want it in the Delaware River watershed. We have to make that case, though, uh, to the Delaware River Basin Commission. Karen, did you want to add something to that? No, but I actually have a question to ask you because I think you can address this better than I ever could. But I think it's, it's a really important point to bring up about how regulation would be done. How would these things be enforced? Who would be doing the enforcing? You know, because I think that's a great concern when we see the model of Pennsylvania and how, you know, how poorly managed things have been. Not that you can ever do it safely enough. You can't possibly regulate it into safety, but they're not even really trying. And so I, I think that might be something people would be interested in commenting on if their concerns about regulation, and if you would have a word about that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the Delaware River Basin Commission has no enforcement arm. They yeah. simply don't. So they don't have inspectors. They don't have people that go out to sites. If they have a problem, one of their geologists or staff people might go in and look at a site. Um, but they do not have an enforcement arm. And we know what has happened. Um, Karen went through it on the slide about the, the problems that we're experiencing here in Pennsylvania that are documented by DEP themselves. Um, and there is really no way to enforce these regulations. Um, also, there is a lack of adequate monitoring, and it's another weakness of the proposed regulations because, you know, it, it's pretty much the case where if you don't know, you think you, it's not going to hurt you. But what has happened is ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance has caused huge human health problems and environmental degradation because we've hidden the truth about what fracking is doing to our environment because we're not monitoring it properly. Where fracking is occurring, there really is, is not adequate groundwater or air monitoring. And because of the exemptions, for instance, in the Clean Air Act, um, they don't have to do the monitoring that they would from another sort of industrial operation. They don't have to aggregate all of the um, emissions from wells within a certain area 
in order to be able to apply Clean Air Act standards. They don't have to, um, under the exemption from the Clean Air Act, uh, regulate hydrogen sulfide, for instance, which is a deadly gas um, that is uh, involved with hydraulic fracturing and is regulated in an other industrial operations, but not in oil and gas operations. So these are all the things that are not monitored and slip through the cracks. And just because we don't know about it doesn't mean it's not hurting us. And that is one of the weaknesses of having the Delaware River Basin Commission allow any sort of fracking. They simply don't have an enforcement arm. They don't have a monitoring program. They don't have a way to actually make any of the things that they're talking about doing, even if we put for forward a better mouse mousetrap, which I, we don't agree is the way to go. But even if someone did put forward a better mousetrap, there's no way to make that mousetrap actually work. So I'm looking here to see if there's other um, questions and does anybody have other questions because we're just a few minutes from 7:30 and we want to honor everybody's time here um, and not um, you know go too too much over um, let's see uh, oh I, I can see there is one thing here about whether or not the DRBC can regulate without raising preemption issues given the federal exemptions on oil and gas um, the Delaware River Basin Commission is a, a, a what they call a an interstate or quasi-federal agency, and it it trumps. I'm sorry to use that word, but it trumps <laughs> um, federal regulation. So they can adopt stricter regulations, and they, in many cases, have adopted stricter regulations than the federal government. Um, they actually, you know, their formation in 1971, uh, 61, actually predated um, the EPA and and the adoption of all of, all of our. Uh, seminal uh, clean water, clean air, all of our environmental laws in the United States. So uh, it was formed by President Kennedy, signed the papers in 1961. It was the first um, uh, watershed-based compact, and it is tremendously powerful. Uh, we're always telling the DRBC, you're the biggest, um, you know, you're the biggest guy in the room, and you need to act like it and ban fracking. And we believe that once they really recognize and exercise that power that they have, um, it will come through um, through any legal challenge, and we'll be able to actually ban fracking in the Delaware River watershed. 17 million people drink water uh, from the Delaware River watershed and can't go any other place to get it. So we need to make sure through this precautionary principle approach that we don't allow it in in order to protect these uh, really irreplaceable resources. So I, I can't see that there is at this point another question that we'll have time to answer, although I wanted to see if Karen wanted to add anything at this point. Um, I, I don't really want to add too, too much except that we're getting ready um, to after these uh, hearings are done and we've done these webinars to prepare for them, we're going to be doing um, sort of like daily uh, talking points on fracking like we've done in other uh, instances in the past in New York. They did 30 days, that sort of thing. Um, but basically, I think if there are any issues that aren't coming up on the calls that are of interest to you, it would be great to hear from you what kind of concerns you have, what kind of things you'd like to be able to talk about, write about, that you aren't hearing us cover. Um, and I think, you know, the question I asked is, is kind of one that I was thinking of, uh, you know, like maybe there are things about the procedural things or the process of how you regulate, things like that that might not get covered when we're talking about, you know, subject area, the areas that are covered in the regulations themselves. But what about maybe some of the more process issues? And, and one other final point, um, uh, you know, as, as I've said earlier, and Tracy said before me, you know, they're, they're going to be looking for certain kinds of things. So let's try to make all of our comments as relevant as possible. So as much as, for instance, I would love to be able to complain about pipelines and things like that, that's not part of this, unfortunately. I wish it was. I wish pipelines were banned too, but that's not part of it. So, you know, so that, that was why Tracy put together this great a webinar tonight that really points to some of the things that are the things to bring up, really to focus on things they have to pay attention to and things that might catch their eye in a way that they're just not going to be so dismissive of if it was something that they said that's just not not my job to worry about. So um, so if you have any ideas for things that, you know, areas you'd like to hear covered better or, you know, that we could focus on on one of those uh, talking point days, let us know. 
Yes, thank you, Karen. That's that's really would really be helpful. We'd like to hear from you. I see also, by the way, that Matt from Delaware Riverkeeper Network put some links up to some studies that people ask questions about. So look in the chat box, and you can get those links. Um, the thing to remember as we go forward in developing our thoughts about how we're going to comment at the public hearings and how we're going to submit written comment is that everything that the Delaware River Basin Commission is looking at is related to the management of water resources. The responsibility that they have that's outlined very clearly in, in their compact and the statutes that govern them uh, has to do with the management of water resources. So any comment that you make, such as air, you need to connect it to how that affects water. And of course, that connection is there. Um, but we need to make the connection for them in order for it to be relevant in this public comment period. Another example is climate change. We need, of course, there are collection connections, in, you know, inseparable connections between climate change and water resources, but you need to make that link in order to make it relevant during this public comment period. So just remember, they really are responsible for the management of the water resources of the Delaware River watershed. And as long as we make our comments relevant to that, they have to listen to us and respond to it. So I'd like to also just thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, at the Facebook link, which is on one of the slides, and I think if Matt can put that Facebook or, or Peter can put that Facebook link up, that would be great. We have all the information about the upcoming DRBC hearings and the links to sign up. Even if you did not sign up by December 31st, which was the deadline to sign up to attend in order to be assured of a speaking slot, you still can sign up online to attend. And as long as there's room in the room, then, they're gonna, then, then you will be able to get into the hearing. We're very, um, we're very uh, uh, dismayed and angered, frankly, by the exclusionary public process that the DRBC has put together on, this, on the proposed ban and the draft regulations. Um, ha doing this in the middle of the winter, only having two hearing days, doing both hearings in Pennsylvania, nothing in New York, New Jersey, or Delaware, um, having them at locations that are very difficult, inaccessible by public transportation, and small rooms. The one in Philadelphia is only 300. My gosh, we fill that up at a regular DRBC meeting. Um, the one in Waymart uh, in Wayne County is only 400. And it's just not fair, and they're really depriving people of their right to, to have public input into this monumental historic decision that the Delaware River Basin Commission is making about fracking in this watershed. But still go ahead and sign up because we know we're tracking it and there are uh, many seats still open in all of the uh, of the um, hearings. So go to those links, sign up to go, and even though you won't be assured of a speaking slot, all of those speaking slots are not yet filled according to the DRBC. So you may be able to still speak and um, they are going, because of uh, our complaints that we made, 109 uh, organizations putting on the record our complaints about um, the, the lousy uh, public process, they did make a couple changes. They won't even allow you to even come to the hearing if you didn't sign up by December 31st. How ridiculous is that? Well, they now are going to allow people to register at the door so you can get in, but only if there's room in the room. But if you register online before the day of the hearing, you're going to be, have a better chance of actually going. We want to pack that room. We want to show them that people are dying to tell them that we want a ban on fracking. We want a complete ban on fracking and all its activities in the watershed. So please go ahead and sign up for those hearings. And then as Karen said, we'll probably be having a webinar at the very beginning of February to kick off a daily comment that we'll be putting out there to help people develop their thoughts and put lots of comments on the record about, about why we need to ban fracking and not allow frack wastewater to be imported or water from the watershed to be exported for fracking. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Karen, for participating. And I, I um, appreciate everyone's time and look forward to you joining us next week where we'll be looking at water and the impacts of the export and depletion of water from the watershed should they allow that for fracking. Thank you all very much tonight. And thank you, Tracy, and thank you, everybody at Delaware Riverkeeper Network for pulling this together. Okay. Bye-bye <laughs> now. Bye-bye.